Yeah. So welcome back to this week's edition of the Rock and Roll Ghost Podcast. This week we have actor Michael Rispoli, who you uh, probably know from such things as The Sopranos. Uh, he was also on Billions, The Deuce, The David Simon Show, uh, a bunch of other movies that you've probably seen him in. Michael is uh, next to be seen in Paramount Plus's uh, Godfather making of series, The Offer, where he plays Tommy Lucchese, one of the heads of the uh, five families in New York that was centered around the whole Godfather uh, drama, let's say. Uh, Michael, it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, how's New York going? Uh, it's great, Brad. Very happy to be here. But I, um, New York is terrific today because it's been cold and it's been snow. The snow has come down and then it was cold. So it just kind of has been frozen all over the ground. But the last couple of days were warm and today we're actually 50 something degrees. So I'm happy. For oh, that. nice. I like when the weather, uh, it's not changing yet, but I like when it's certainly on its way uh, to warmer. Um, the, the long winters are starting to, um, I prefer short winters. I'll put it to Yeah, you. yeah. Yeah, me too. Me too. I've never been a fan of winter. Uh, yeah. Well, let, let me tell, let's, let's talk a little bit about the offer first. Um, you know, you play probably one of the most famous heads of, uh, of the mob. Uh, Tommy Lucchese, uh, how, yeah. how, did, how did you go about, first, how did you get the role? And then, and then you know, what, you know, what process you went through to get the role? And then how did you find your way into this real life person? Huh. Well, listen, thank you for those questions. Um, first, I, I, I want to tell you, Brett, honestly, um, the offer is a great series because there's uh, 10 of them, I believe. It's a 10 part series. Um, but it is not at all about, I shouldn't say at all, it's not about the, the real life mob families that were in New York at the time. We're on the outside of the story. And the great story has to do with um, um, the producing of it and how they put together this film, you know, from through it was a Paramount Pictures and Paramount Pictures at the time was was in trouble, you know, in this early 70s thing. But they had uh, you're going to have to help me with some of the names now because. Um, um, well, there was Charlie Bloodhorn who, who ran, who owned he's in, Fox. Yes, right. Charlie Bloodhorn is a character in there. Um, uh, Al, uh, the, the story is based on, uh, who's still around and he's still producing. Al I'm sorry Ruddy. to do this brother. What's no, no, that? Go ahead. Al, Al Ruddy. Ruddy. Yeah. Al Ruddy. Uh, I got to let the cat in, man. It's my yeah, daughter. Go ahead. Gotta let no, no, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I got my daughter's cat and my, well, the hat, the cat's kind of a house cat. And then my daughter's dog, she'll be back soon. Anyways. Um, so <laughs> I'm looking, things are catching my eye in the background here. Anyway, no, no, so, no, I, 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 I get you. So, um, so it's about, it's, it's Al Ruddy's story. You know, it's about yeah. him and how he produced everything, uh, in order to get this. And up until that point, he was not a producer per se, uh, you know, as far as Hollywood goes, he did do a television show. Uh, that he produced and that was kind of like he kind of fell into it because his neighbor was a tv producer and he happened to pitch the story with him and all of a sudden he produced the television but as far as like uh film and everything goes he hadn't produced anything then he went and produced the film which was not successful um and then they uh the studio um zeroed in on him because he's got a lot of moxie you know uh al ruddy and um, The Godfather was a book that was a, a huge uh, success and they had bought the rights to it, Paramount did, but they weren't exactly sure how to make the film because gangster movies at that point were on a way lull kind of like, now, you, you know, uh, back in the thirties, you know, Warner Brothers would, you know, Edward G. Robinson, Cagney, all of those guys, yeah. Bogart, they were huge, you know, those gangster movies and they were around for the longest time. And then they kind of went away, then they came back. Um, anyways, around that time, gangster films hadn't done well, and they weren't really making them so much um, to any kind of great success. And now they have this great book, um, which became it has become an iconic book, and the movie became an iconic movie. Um, but um, 
at the time they didn't know how great it would be. And Albert Ruddy kind of didn't know. All he knew was that he was a very determined man who was going to make sure that this worked because he, you know, he got a shot. Uh, he got a shot. Um, the kid stays in the picture. Uh, that book, Robert Evans. Robert Evans is huge in here. Uh, he's it's a huge thing because he ran. Um, he was running Paramount at the time, and he was, uh, you know, that quintessential Hollywood, you know, tan, good looking, knew how to talk and schmooze it up, and very, you know, bright uh, with everything. And and then within under his time, they did Chinatown, they did Godfather, they did. I think he had done Rosemary's Baby, which was late '60s. Anyway, I'm giving you such a backstory because what the offer is about is the making of mm -hmm. The Godfather based upon a large part, I think maybe most of it, on Al Ruddy's, not memoirs, but something like a memoir, you know? Okay. Um, like what he had written about it. And in there, with all the stuff he had to deal with, he had to deal with um, the New York mob. And the New York mob was like, some of them were like, hey, you know, we hate this book. It doesn't make us look good. I don't like this book. We're not going to allow it. Um, and other ones are like, hey, it's a book to shut up and let him do what he's going to do. And then they wanted to film it in uh, New York. But, you know, you had to go through the mob to get a film because if they didn't want to film, you weren't going to get a film. This is what it was like. Yeah. So the major player in that uh, um, in that scenario, um, and according to the Ruddy uh, you know, memoirs and stuff and what the script is about when it comes to the New York mob, which eventually you're gonna, I'll get back to where I come in. Yeah, is uh, yeah. the the character of Joseph Colombo, who started the um, not the Italian Anti Defamation League, but some, it was it was that. Yeah, that sounds that sounds. Uh... Yeah, it, but they had it. Yes, but it was like that sort of organization. Meanwhile, right. Colombo himself was a boss. You know, right? It was what became known as the Colombo family. But at the time. Um, he did not like that movie. Uh, he didn't like the book and he didn't like there was going to be a movie and he just didn't like any of that because it was going against what he felt, you know, um, was um, the defaming of Italian Americans at the time. And um, so he's a major player in, in the piece because he out, he goes to see Al Ruddy or he calls him in and he's like, you know, you ain't going to do this film. They become uh, good friends. Uh, or at least they become allies and what have you. So on top of everybody else, the casting, the writing, the script, you know, Bob Evans going, where's my script? Where's my pages? You know, all of this other stuff, you got this, all of a sudden you got these real life mobsters who are saying, this is what you're going to do and that's what you're not going to do. Coming back to me as Tommy Lucchese, with, uh, which I, I got to tell you, Brett, um, I'm I'm just a representative, me and a, the, guy, the Carlo Gambino character and a couple of the other guys of the old guard. And because Colombo was a generation below us, when he was a boss, he would come to us and say, I want to do this, I want to do that, I want to do the other thing. And we would either nod yes or no. So um, I wish I could say there was a hell of a lot you know, um, more of a story turned on uh, Tommy Lucchese, but that's, um, we represent the old guard. And as far as the film goes, it's about, you know, um, Ruddy making The Godfather, which is great. The guys who play right. Boos, I'm sorry I don't have the actors' names because we met in rehearsal, which was right. great. Rehearsals were great because um, they actually rehearsed, which you don't get uh, a chance to do very often. But we rehearsed um, a number of times in the beginning. And then, of course, once they start shooting, there's not time for rehearsal. Um, you got the Mario Puzo character. I'm so I feel so ashamed. I don't know the actor's name right now. Yeah, I, I can't remember off the top of my you head. You know what it is? It, I should do my homework here because because it's it was a long you know, this was months and months ago. And um, right. I was. I was so excited to do, um, you know, to be a part of it and everything. But I was working on what I had to do, um, and I was. Well, your um, your section of the story, because I've read most of the the. There's a fairly recent book out about the making of the Godfather. Your, yeah, your okay. section is kind of, you know, almost separate. Like Al Ruddy play, it's like Al Ruddy is central because he has to go between both worlds. He has to go. Between yes. the and the New York, you know, section with 
you know, dealing with the mob because of the unions and all that. And you don't, if you don't have the unions, you can't film in New York back then, especially. Right. Yeah, but let me ask you something, Brett. What was the name of the book that you read? Uh, uh let's see now. I... And, and if you listen, if you don't have the name, that's fine. But no, no, this is the this is the best part of the show where where the host because I I've been doing this a lot lately. I've been looking up things on my phone, so I'm sure my that's office. Right, man. That's why you... it's leave leave the gun, take the cannoli. Oh yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. So so my thing is so. My thing is, I mean, I've always been a, you know, a, a, is it kind of roles I play? I play cops and I play crooks. But since I was a kid, I was, you know, uh, I was always reading about like, you know, uh, gangsters and Al Capone and Bonnie and Clyde and everybody else, you know, different kind of gangsters. But, you know, all those guys, Babyface, Nelson, everybody else. My thing, Dillinger, but then the, you know, Capone and all of that stuff. I've read all of these books. So I kind of grew up, you know, um, you know, loving this subject. And of course, I know Tommy Lucchese, they called him Three Finger Brown because he had lost some fingers on his hand, his thumb and his, and his other finger. They called him Three Finger Brown, which he didn't like. But um, I mean, <laughs> vicious, these were vicious old time uh, gangsters. You know, uh, Gambino and him, um, Joe Bonanno, you know, these guys came up. You mind if I talk about this for a minute? Yeah, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm. Go ahead. So, the, so you got to figure, you got to remember that the, um, and listen, I'm not an expert, but I, I'm, this will be a pretty good, rend I, I say rendition of a little historical uh, yeah. thing about the like rise of the mob. Like there you go. Thank you. Yeah. So of the history of the mob in, in the America. Well, with the, you know, with the, um, obviously at the turn of the last century going into the 1900s, you know, there'd been, you know, immigration or land of immigrants and, you had different waves of immigrants coming over for quite a while. The Southern Italian immigrants, though, I mean, that the Italian immigration and stuff was my great, not my great, my grandfather, you know, um, came over in the early, uh, early teens. Prior to that, though, my grandmother's father had been over here in like the 1890s and stuff. And Italians were coming before them, but there was a huge influx around that time. So around the uh, 1900 and so. So these guys were all born like 1900, 1901, 1911, maybe, you know, whatever. So when they came up to the Volstead Act, which was prohibition, and you're wearing a Chicago shirt, so you know, it, you know, famous Chicago stuff with Al Capone, all of these guys were young, you know, tough guys who came from the street because obviously there was poverty. And where did you go? You went into the crowded tenements. How'd you fight your way out of there? You literally had a fight, you know, and you became a criminal. Not everybody. I mean, it was a tremendous amount of Italian American, you know, Jews and and everybody else who were living in those tenements who, um, you know, were not, you know, criminal, obviously. But that one part of the Italian culture that came through was the black hand and it was, and New York was run by a couple of what they called mustache peats because they were like from the old country born over there came here had their you know their big mustaches and they were men of respect and they had a certain way of running things well these young guys like um, um, Vito Genovese and Bonanno Tommy Lucchese these were like the, the, the young toughs, so teenagers, 20 years old, when they started running um, booze, you know, it was a tough game, like selling drugs. Now it was, you had to outrun the, the cops and you had to fight against the other guys trying to take your territory. So all of these guys, there's an old quote, made their bones. They say that in The Godfather, Sonny says that. You know, when you make your bones is when you make your, you know, you show yourself and it's like kind of official, you know, some people say it means killing and whatever else. But these guys did all those jobs and they were coming up. So they're young Turks in their late teens, early 20s who are running the booze, shooting the guns, blowing up the other, the, the, uh, the other person's distilleries and hijacking and everything. And they got to take care of like, you know, they take care of business. They had jobs to do. So yeah. all of these guys came up. So this is the first generation of the American gangsters being formed during this um, uh, during the prohibition period. They they earned their stripes during that period. Once that period, um, once they became um, 
the mustache peats were gone, you know, um, because of Lucky Luciano and, and, and everything like that, you know, he said, we're going to organize into these families and we're not going to fight. We're going to be families and we're going to organize. Well, these are still young men in their mid twenties. Al Capone was 25 when he went to Chicago. Yeah. You know, people don't realize that these guys were young and hungry and ready to, you know, to shoot and, and whatever else they had to do. So Tommy Lucchese, the character I played, Joe Bonanno, um, Carlo Gambino, all these guys were like, they're in their mid, you know, they're 25, 24, 28, when all of this power and money was coming about because of Prohibition, because of moving the illegal liquor at the time. So by the time uh, Prohibition was over and the Volstead Act was repealed, by the time that happened, these guys were well ensconced with a ton of money and a lot of connections with cops and judges and politicians and everything, who at the time said, hey, it's just a drink. You know, whereas now with the drugs that have been, you know, that go through organized crime, it's not the same thing. And they say it in the movie, The Godfather, drugs is a dirty business, you know, um, and there's a lot of um, theories about whether they, they're they supposed to handle it. They're not supposed to handle it, but they do under the table because there's a lot of money. Are you following me? Am I rattled? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm with you on all this. So by the time, so these guys... Uh, by the time this comes around, which is the end of the 60s and the beginning of 1970, I'm one of the first generations of guys. Tommy Lucchese, Gambino, um, you know, Luciano had died back in the 50s, but the, we're like of that first generation that came up and built it from when we were young, from the street right. all the way up. We're cagey. We know what to do. We keep our mouths shut. Nobody talks. And that's why the mob had a stranglehold on everything. Because once you get that kind of money, and then you have and then you have the ability of over life and death, you know, you're running all sorts of other operations, the unions, as you say, you know, besides there's gambling, prostitution, all these other things. So these guys came up, but now I'm, you know, in the movie, I'm 60 something years old, you know. Gambino, 60 something years old. But we represent those guys from the old good. Joe Colombo is from the generation that comes after us. So he still had the traditions of what it was supposed to be like, the way you're supposed to behave as a as a mob guy, you know, like you keep your mouth shut, you don't, you know, say anything. You know, very hard. And people were very afraid. Every every neighborhood, every Italian neighborhood had some kind of boss in it, you know, whether minor or major, but they had an answer to the bigger bosses. Joe Colombo has all of that respect, but he's of a different generation. So just like, you know, um, a children in a house, you know, if there's one kid who's and then he's got a brother who's 10 years younger, they have different traditions that they follow. Chances are the older one is more closely related to more closely following the traditions of the mother and father. The one that's 10 years later is dancing jazz and doing, you know, um, different things. Um, so he's had a different way to live life. Colombo was following the old rule, following the old order. So when he became a boss, he came up to us guys and would say, there's this and that, and I'll handle this and I'll handle Ruddy and I'll do this and I'll do that. Um, that's being played. Joe Colombo is being played brilliantly, brilliantly, by the way, by my a good friend and tremendous actor, Giovanni Rabisi. Uh, yeah. He's just great. Everything I watch Giovanni do, I'm, I'm just amazed at. And um, and he's terrific. He plays Joe Colombo in yeah. this. Um, so um, so I guess, I don't know. I just got lost because I'm freaking rattling away. <laughs> well, here. Giovanni looks completely different from, I, I don't. Oh, I, yeah. I haven't seen him in a while in something. Um, he, he put on, listen, he worked very hard on that because Giovanni is, you know, he's, he's, he's a, uh, you know, he has a slight build, you know, he's, um, but he put on weight and he worked very hard putting that weight on. They're not padding him with stuff. Yeah. You know, like he did the work. He's that kind of a disciplined actor that, you know, he sees the way in and he sees the way he's going to go uh, the way into a character and, and he goes all the way. He's really, I'm telling you, I've always, before I worked with him, I was like, this kid is great. I call him kid, you know. But, yeah, yeah. But my thing is, so it's great. And he plays uh, Joe Colombo. Um, um, Miles Teller, it plays Al Ruddy. 
Right. And listen, I've always admired, you know, I mean, I've always admired everything about, I mean, all the, the, you know, the films, when I watch Miles Town, I'm like, this guy's really good. I mean, he's terrific. Yeah, yeah. I've never worked with him before, but I didn't have any scenes with him either. So I can only observe him during rehearsals and during rehearsals, he was sharp as a tack and he was great. Yeah. I mean, I can't, I mean, I didn't work with, I only worked with the mob element and Giovanni. So I can't, right, Julie, right. Julie Temple, you know, is, she blows my mind. I watch her and I'm like, I can watch her. She's just great. She's great. So they have a tremendous cast that's in here, and I'm so happy to be a part of it. And then the producers of the uh, of the um, the show couldn't have been uh, more generous with everybody's time. You got to remember, we were filming this in full blown COVID time, yeah. when there's all the restrictions on the sets and everything. So there was everybody had to be. You had to do your testing, you had to do everything, and there was the mask wearing and, and all of that. But it's a very, very large cast and a large crew. And they all work so hard, you know? So, um, you know, people put in that extra time to try and keep everything, um, you know, the production rolling, you know? So I'm looking forward to seeing it. Yeah, me too. Because, I, I mean, The Godfather, you know, is con is always in my top five. Of all in fact, um, they're re-releasing before this new uh video 4k video version hits hits you know um whatever uh, video purchasing in whatever form you have they're releasing in the theater for one night so i'm gonna go uh check that out but i saw, I saw that they're re-releasing in the movies which I saw, no, I didn't. I did not see the Godfather on a big film, although a uh, big screen, although I feel like I might have in the early 80s in New York for some reason. At one of those, well, there's uh, a lot of revivals, you know, they have been right. Okay, because yeah. they used to have, in New York, used to have the those revival houses where you could go in and you'd see, you know, what I saw one time there because you're a big film fan, right? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. <laughs> now it sounds goofy, right? But it was the yeah. early 80s. And there was a revival house, and um, I went in. I'm like, "Hey, I'm gonna go watch this," because um, it was the second of the. It was this. It, we didn't go to just for that. You you had a double feature. You can watch both. They did this. Maybe it was Casablanca. Sounds weird that then they would have. No, I, yeah. yeah. But um, anyways, Abbott and Costello, and I never saw. I knew Abbott and Costello. I watched them on TV growing up, all reruns. But right. I knew all the movies and Saturday morning. There we are. I go there with my friend at the time, my girlfriend at the time, and I'm watching this movie on a big screen, and I saw stuff I had never seen before because yeah. those movies, those, they were meant to be shown on the big screen. Yeah, yeah. I finally saw them on your TV screen, you know? Yeah. But all yeah. of a sudden, things are clear. You go, oh, my God, I didn't realize that. There's this and there's that. They were meant to be on that big screen. That's the way they yeah. filmed And I'm like, Jen, I've seen this movie. On oh, I know. Sorry. It wasn't Gossip Blank. It was a Marx Brothers movie. Oh, well, that's, so a good, that's a good that double was, feature. Yes, exactly. And that's what the, and whatever it was, Duck Soup or Coconuts or whatever. The thing is, that was another thing. You didn't, I never saw those on the big screen, but I'd seen them 50 times on TV. Right, So seeing right. them on a big screen is a big difference, you know, because they were yeah, meant yeah. to be big screen. Yeah, well, the, the, the Godfather series is, is one of my favorites, so I, I'm really looking forward to this, and I have to imagine that was a big um, attraction to you to be part of the Godfather story in any way. Um, it was great, and I loved it. And Nikki Toscano is one; uh, she was kind of like the showrunner, like on the set. I mean, and she is she's fierce. I mean, like nice, sweet, everything like that. But I mean, fierce. Right. She's got a, an eye. She's like this, this, that, that, and big smile on her face. And she was like running things. And so when I was on the set and being part of it, um, you just felt like a, a family. She made everybody feel like a family. Had to get your work done, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Um, she, I mean, you know, she's just great. Dexter Fletcher, Fletcher was the one who cast me, and he is um, a tremendous director. He's the one who said, we got to do rehearsals, pal. And I'm like, I live in New York. How am I going to go out there and do rehearsals? You're coming out and doing rehearsals. Yeah. So, you know, again, um, you know, he, he, it was like great. And you so you saw the dedication of the director. And, I, and I'm sure Dexter is a producer as well, obviously. And uh, Nikki Toscano and a number of other ones. Um, 
Um, and they were just working hard on it the whole time. Nobody took it for granted because it's such a, uh, it's such a, um, I'm sorry, I'm looking on here because I wanted to see, uh, I'm sorry, I've done a few projects since then and I'm yeah, yeah. getting names. Um, but uh, it was great to be a part of it. Yes, you said, what was it like to be a part of it? Well, I, I loved it. I'm part of the Godfather. Can I tell you a quick Godfather story? Sure, yeah, go ahead. So growing up in New York, I lived outside New York City, just a half an hour outside the city in Rockland County. So everybody in Rockland County, you know, most people had moved up from the Bronx or, or you know, my father was from Brooklyn, my mother was from the Bronx. They got married, they moved up to Rockland, which was like the country in a sense. Um, so my friends, when I was in middle school, middle, I mean, when I was in elementary school, what we call grammar school, in the middle of the 60s, there was a big influx into the county because cops and firemen were allowed to live outside the city limits. I think it was Mayor Wagner or, or at the time, um, not that I knew it at the time, but he finally allowed cops and firemen. It, there used to be a law in New York City. Yeah. If you were if you lived in the city, if you were, had a city job, a cop, a fireman, sanitation or whatever, you had to live in the city limits. Right. Well, that was being pushed at through the 50s and what have you. And then by the time the 60s, middle of the 60s, they said, it's OK, you can live outside the city. So there was a big influx. So a lot of my friends that came up in the middle of the 60s and, you know, continuing into the 70s, you know, had moved out of the city, um, you know, were coming up from the Bro from Brooklyn or the Bronx or, or whatever else. During that period of time. I grew up in a very proud Italian-American household. My father had a hardware store. It was a big store in a little town. I'm one of eight kids. And, um, and uh, you know, that was a big, it was a big thing. When you hit around that age, around 10 or 11 or something like that, you start feeling like that Italian, like for me, my cousins, my aunts, my uncles were Italian. You know, that's it. Yeah. But there was a big move by Joe Colombo. And I'm going to look up this. It's the it, Joe Colombo. It was something else besides the Anti-Defamation League. But um, and it was a whole thing. Kiss me, I'm Italian. And there was Italian T-shirts with Italian flag. And it was like, you're Italian, you're Italian, you're Italian. And people would wear the you know, horn, the according know they call it, on the on the, the neck. And it was like, or the hats what would be like green, white and red, you know. Yeah, and yeah. um and the whole thing was, all of a sudden, I'm coming into that going, yeah, I am Italian, I'm Italian, I'm Italian. And that keeps going on up into, you know, when Rocky comes out, you know, in 76, you know, um, uh, you know, being Italian, Eddie Murphy used to make a joke, you never want to get into a fight with an Italian guy, right after he saw Rocky, you know, it was kind of funny, because you felt that pride, you know, yeah, yeah, I'm Italian, Italian. But in 71, 70, and all of that, huge thing about being Italian and standing up for your rights, and which Joe Colombo did. And unfortunately for Joe Colombo, he um, he pushed the boundaries too much because he himself was uh, head of a family. So he was right. a cop. So he himself was saying, you know, you can't say mafia and this is Italian. You guys are you guys are making the Italians uh, look bad and everything. Italian American Civil Rights League was what it was. Oh, called. OK. OK. So, so um. So the other guys, Tommy Lucchese, Gambino, I was saying, hey, hey, keep a low profile, keep a low profile, don't push this. But they're kind of making, they're getting power from this too, and they're making money from it. And Joe Colombo is doing all that. But at the time, I'm a kid, 10, 11 years old. I don't know any of this. I just think there's an Italian guy who's, you know, making sure that we're standing up for ourselves. Right. And everything. So when he gets um, the assassination, which didn't happen immediately, but he gets shot and everything goes and becomes um, and goes into a coma. Columbus Circle that year in 1971. It was a huge thing, and the whole thing was who did it? The old guys wanted him to keep his mouth shut, or um, or was it the person who actually pulled the trigger and then his bodyguards immediately killed him? Was it yeah. Joey Gallo, who he was in a huge fight with, who, by the way, a year later was killed in Little Italy, you know? Um, so the, you, they don't know, but they think because uh, Joe Colombo was um, stepping out too far, like he was call, uh, calling too much attention to himself. Right. Not like Don Corleone, 
who never called attention to himself. That's why right. he was so powerful. One of the reasons, you know, they say that about Lucchese too. And Gambino, you know, not fancy clothes, none of that kind of thing, quiet, wielded a ton of power, you know. Anyways, it, that it gets dealt with in the whole backstory of the Albert, the Albert Ruddy, um, these memoirs that are talking about making of The Godfather, which is called The Offer, which is what this show is all about. They show that uh, dynamic and that, you know, going yeah. head to head. Yeah, um, that, so was a, that was a pretty pivotal time for the... New York mob, especially um, because it, there was and for of, an impressionable you know, Italian American kid at the yeah. time, I was like, you know, I I felt so proud, you know, to be Italian. We yeah. were always proud of being Italian, you know, being Italian. You know, they had to go to school, had to go to church. We did everything like that. We were not in that criminal element side of things, you know, as so many Italian Americans were not. But uh, people would think you might be, you know, because of yeah. the old. Um, the old stereotypes and the tropes. So when Joe, when when Joe Colombo said, "Don't think of us that way," and they they never say the word mafia in The Godfather, right? right. And he said, "I'll let you do this, but you can't use the word mafia." According to the script, he hated this book. He thought it made us. He thought he made the Italian Americans look stupid. He did not like the book. But Albert Ruddy, who is a tremendous producer, legendary, um, kind of just kept going forward. And he, he said, yes, 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 yes. We won't do that. We won't do that. We're going to do this. Putting that film together with so many loose parts. And then you put it together. And honestly, it's it's a uh, it's a perfect film. I mean, you know, it's yeah. hard to say. There's only a few phenomenally, you know, perfect films, you know. Right. No, that's that's I think that's very true. I think it. it that's what's amazing about it is that all that strife that, you know, took took it to get onto the screen, all the fights that, you know, Coppola had over casting and the the internal the internal fights over Coppola mm -hmm. and and dealing with Puzo, who could be from what I gather hard to deal with as well. He would stop writing for a while and go on like a gambling, you know. You know, yarn. Uh, listen, and you know, food was big. You know, food's always big with Italians, but yeah, um, like food was a big thing because they both like to eat. You know, but Coppola and um, uh, what do they call it? The guys. Uh, I'm doing it, man. I'm sorry. I got to do it right. this way. Uh, Dan Fogler plays Francis Ford. Yeah, Cole. yeah, right. Tremendous. I mean, I'm like, holy shit! Where'd you find these guys? You know. Um, and then Patrick Gallo plays Mario Puzo. They got tremendous scenes together. And I'm like, oh, I love those scenes. I love those characters. I mean, they, you know, they really bring things to life, you know. Um, and that was and it was a time where these were young guys. Like, you know, Puzo thought who he was. Not, I don't want to say that. They had egos. You know, you have to, you know, you got you to gotta, you have to negotiate around the egos of everybody. When you're young, you're like, yeah, this is the way it is, and that's the way it's going to be, because that's my artistic purity and stuff. And right, right. You have to, I like those stories because, you know, there's a clash, and, you know, once there's a clash, you get the fire, and the fire is what we all love staring at, you know? Yeah, so, yeah. Um, and this is true. This is, you know, based on all true things. So. Well, what I love, what I've always loved this, is, this has been well known for a long time, is how much Coppola didn't want to do the Godfather. He thought it was trash. He, he, he just he didn't he didn't think anything of it. He wanted to make art films, and what he ended well, up he had written, he had written making Patton. an art film, right? He had written Patton, and Patton right. was you know was a huge. I mean you know obviously it won, I might have, did it win best best picture it certainly. It was he was he, he won he won for screenplay. Right. So, so, you know, he wanted, you know, these powerful with these things and what have you. And I believe he had directed, I believe he had directed so, something prior before that, but he, he had direct. Was, yeah, he did. Um, he were he did some Roger Corman stuff. I think he did dementia 13, which is a horror film. For, right. So, so once horror. when he gets this, and now he and once they come around, it's a really good scene. It's so well written. God, what the fuck is the writer's name? God damn it! Excuse me. Sorry. He was. I gotta look it up. I'm sorry. I've done a, few, <laughs> I've done a number of projects. Yeah. Well, he, um, Copeland also directed the Rain People before then too, which uh, I forget. I forget who was in the Rain People, but it, all right. So, so with that being said, right? 
With that being said, he had his way that he was going to do it. And because right. he wanted to do art, he knew that world so well. He's a, he's the son's, he's a son of an immigrant. You know, he's the son yeah. of that world. So when he was able to put that on screen, which is hard, you know, not everybody remembers things. You know, you remember things through rose-colored glasses or something. He just caught that world. It's like what Scazzese does. Scazzese knows that world so well, and and then he does it. So when you say you write what you know, and Puzo, of course, knowing that world because he's a, you know, writer um and whatever, like you know, he knows of that world. Puzo didn't want to write about the mob. He was writing some other book, and the people you used to go to book. They still do it, but you go to a bookstore and you read parts of your book, you know, um, in order to help sell it. The author's here tonight. Come and get a signed copy. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know the name of the book. Oh, The Fortunate Pilgrim, was it? Or um, The Sicilian that. or something. And they said, you know, they really picked, they really perked up when you were writing, reading about the mob stuff. You get a mob stuff. You know, that's crap. You know, those yeah, yeah. gangsters are no good. You know, he has pride yeah. being an Italian. You want to do. But then he writes like the quintessential. Well, it, what was interesting is that he, he, you know, in the, that book I was saying I was reading, is that they talk about he did he did a lot of research, but he just happened to kind of know because of the neighborhood he he grew up in, and because he was a gambler, he had you know um, he, had he knew the bets and now yeah, I mean, he knew too. he knew yeah you had a you had a you had to put your bets in with a bookie, and the bookies were all run by the mob. So right, right, yeah. So I mean, that's what I mean, like. My mother grew up in the Bronx. My grandfather had a fruit and vegetable stand, um, you know, store, you know, started as a stand, but, you know, worked up to a store and what have you. Um, my mother said that everybody, when she was a kid, a little girl and everything like that, every neighborhood, all the neighborhoods had that mob figure in that neighborhood. Oh, yeah. Uh, and you didn't deal with it. If you weren't involved with them, they weren't involved with you uh, sort of thing. But that neighborhood had somebody like that. Um, and she was aware of it. And as she grew up, she said, you know, there was, um, you know, as she grew up, you, she was aware of what they did and where and, and how to avoid that getting involved with them. But a lot of people got involved with them. You know, um, so you could avoid it and you were aware of it. So if you're an Italian growing up in New York in the 30s, you know, 20s, 30s and everything like that, you knew these people existed. You didn't talk about them. You know, you didn't do that. You hope your father never borrowed money from them because you'd yeah, never yeah. get out of that. You know, um, and if your family was going to church and working and keeping, a, you know, an honest life, they wouldn't have to, you know, have to worry about any other kind of harm. And there was kind of those rules. So, um so the fact that Puzo had to deal with that and then Coppola uh, understood that too because, you know, he had seen it and they were able to put it so well into the film. I'll tell you this real quick, Brett. Not that I'm yeah. saying this because I'm rattling on, but um, <laughs> so I get a job in a restaurant called Ralph's Granada, which was a pizza place, but it was an Italian restaurant as well. But for us, we'd only get pizza because we never went to Italian restaurants, my family. I'd say, Mom, why don't we go to an Italian restaurant? Because you eat Italian at home. I'm not going to go out. And eat pizza. <laughs> I'm not going to pay for it. He was right. I mean, you know, and then, and here's something else. I'll tell you this. Every kid growing up for me, and now it's a little more watered down with everything. But when I was growing up, you know, they were more like, you know, this one's Irish, that one's Jewish, this one's Polish, this one's Italian, you know. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. a little bit, you know, closer to the old country, wherever wherever there, my people, more people came. People stuck to their own nationality. It was more of that, but then it's also, it's also had to do with a church thing, too, because... Yeah, yeah. Polish and Irish and, and Italians, you know, I mean, you can all be Catholic and, and you're going to the same church, but even though you, and so you live near each other because the church was the center of the, you know, of the right. school life and whatever, and, you know, that parish. But either way, they all live near each other because everybody, you know, family was a big deal for, for each and everybody, you know, Jews, Italians, whoever. I'm not a social I'm not a society expert, you know, in that sense. Society is not the right word. But, but, um, um, my, the hell is my point? I was just, I just got lost because I went off on such a tangent. Well, uh, I think you were talking about eating, eating food. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, food, uh, food would be a big thing. Yeah. Nah, I freaking got lost. 
because I still I just you know what happened, you know what Oh, you were working at the restaurant. Ralph's Quinata. So yeah, yeah. in that perspective, right? Pizza's pizza places, when I was a kid, you're talking, you know, 1970s stuff, they were owned by Italians, you know, because yeah, yeah. Italians made great because they also made spaghetti and meatballs and veal parmesan and whatever else it was there these were like italians owned the pizza places when i was a kid you know yeah uh, now every, anybody can own a pizza place now there's pizza Hut and you know Domino's, which you know suffice when you you know when you're hungry and it's late at night nobody's delivering you know that's great i grew up on pizza pizza you know so you yeah, used yeah. to have whose pizza is the best is it is it raised you know in new york they talk about raised pizza but yeah. there was a place called Rudy's Pizza that was nearby. There was Ralph's Pizza. There was Volante's. You know, who's got the best pizza? You used to be able to argue that. Now pizza is so American, you kind of can't argue that so much anymore because it's everywhere, you know? Yeah, yeah. Pizza, pizza places. And it's so corporate. But anyways, I'm working in Ralph's Granada. Mr. Senzamichi, may he rest in peace. Um, and he had, um, and, they, and Mrs. Senzamichi, and they, she rest in peace because they're, they're gone. Um, but they're, they're two sons and a daughter around the same age as uh, me, my brother, and my sister, a couple of my sisters, you know. So we got to know each other because their restaurant was not was in the same area that my family's hardware store. So we'd spend a lot of time. When I got older and I was a um, senior in high school, um, well, I worked there. I was a dishwasher and I worked for Mr. Senzamichi. But let me jump back. Mr. Senzamichi happened to know somebody or somebody knew him, a distributor of the mozzarella or something that he would buy. And they said, hey, they need extras for this movie called The Godfather. So Mr. Senzamichi and his wife and their kids were extras in the wedding scene. Oh. Uh, they shot the wedding scene, right? And I didn't know what the hell that meant. And I, I'm a kid, so I mean, I don't know any of that, but I knew of the story. And then they said, Mr. Sanzamichi got into the film. So, you know, in the film, when they take Tessio away at the end of the film, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, Tessio comes walking out and he sees Tom Hagen and he says, and he goes, uh, tell Michael it was nothing, you know, it was never personal. I always liked him. You know, can you, can you let me go for old time's sake? And he's like, uh, no. Is it Sal Tessio? I forget. No, so yeah, 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 Sally. You know, and they take him away, and then they take him away. Well, Mr. Sezamichi clears the bell, is one of those, one of the, the guys who were putting him in the car, you know? Oh, wow. And, yeah, so it's great. Whenever I see the film, I go, there's Mr. Sezamichi, you know? <laughs> but anyways, in the restaurant, I, you know, I worked in the, re you know, so I knew that. But when I, as I'm growing up, and you go to the different Italian, the different pizza places, wherever it may have been, there's a famous, iconic picture of, the Godfather, uh, it's an in-between shot. You know, it's a, it, the actors are leaning against the car. Marlon Brando, um, Al Pacino, um, um, what are they call it? Yeah, James, no, James Conn, John Cazale. They're all like just leaning against the car. You know, it's like at the wedding or something. And it's like when, you know, in between the takes, they're moving the cameras. It just happens to be a casual picture. It's not a picture out of the film. You know, right. And that that picture you would see in the back behind the counter at all these different pizza places or Italian delis everywhere. And you're like, and I and it was in Mr. Sanzamichi's um restaurant. And I always think it, it's there because he was in the movie. It makes sense to me. But I right. see it in other places and I go, Were you in the movie? And we go, No, no, that's the Corleone family. Yeah, yeah, I know. No, it's just a great picture, the Corleones, you know. So yeah. I wonder yeah. how that got uh, if how that got distributed so well. I <laughs> don't know. I don't know. But my point is, like, there was a great pride taken mm -hmm. by Italian American families in the how the Corleones um, they meant honor, they meant strength. Don't tread on me, which was very American, right? You know, don't screw with my family or else watch out. And yet they right. love their babies and they kiss their you know what I mean? They honored their parents. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, they no, it was a very ideal, idealized version of, of the mob, unfortunately. I mean, that, that's, you know, looking, well, now that we look back, it's like, you know, the mob probably were, were better, you know, than they became, but they weren't the godfather, really. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't just that. 
um, in terms, you know, a lot of a lot of things have come out that, you know, we're it, it's a very hyper idealized version. Oh yeah, that I know picture. that picture. I know that picture. Yeah. yeah. That that picture. So that picture is this isn't a picture that was used in, in the movie. These are just the actors no. hanging out and they say, no. hey, you guys, let's take a picture. It was probably so, ended up being a poster or something, too. Right, right. But you see, it represented a certain kind of like pride. So people who weren't in the I always it, to me, it made sense. It was in Mr. Sanzamichi's restaurant because he was All in right. the movie. But I'd see it everywhere. And I'm going, you know, why do you have that picture? You weren't in the movie. It's because people identified with the oh, yeah. better angels, the better angels of the Corleone family. Yeah, you know, no, it, and, it, that, that's what's amazing is how good of a uh, a family, you know, not it's not not for the whole family, but it's a family movie nonetheless. It's a very it's all about that's why it's so brilliant because it's not you know they were making movies about mobsters that started looking stale and not good because it's crime, 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 crime. The best moments, are, you know, this is about a family that happens to do crime. Right, That's why right. the Godfather is so iconic because we all yeah. get it. You know, we understand it's about a family that happens to do, you know, happens to be in the crime business, you know? Yeah, yeah. And listen, just to go back to the old Warner Brothers movies, Brett, you know, with Cagney and, and all those other guys, like, you know, and, and, you know, a whole bunch of angels with dirty faces and you know, all the great, the bogey movies and everything. I mean, those characters that were great. George Raft was a huge star. Those characters, there was always Ma, you know, at home, you know, who was work, working hard in the tenement, you know, the cold water flat as a washerwoman. And she took in laundry or something. And you'd have like, you know, the, you know, the Cagney tough guy, whoever come up, well, hey, Ma, I'm going to get you out of here one day. We're going to yeah, go yeah. live, you know. Whatever she go, oh, just be a good boy, Johnny. You know, it'd be like that. There was like good old Ma at home. So that yeah. gives you like the home kind of feeling of like, you know, this guy is really just a wayward kid, even though he's a cold blooded killer, you know. Um, yeah. you know, in the story. Anyways, Brett, I'm yapping away about, you know, everything, you know, all this stuff. Tell me, um, Ask me, ask me something else that you might. Well, there's there's just a uh, we've covered a lot, but there are just a couple other questions I I had, and one is uh, I saw that your uh, a film you're attached to is in pre production, so I don't know what the of it is. It's one co written, uh, directed and and co starring Nicholas Turturro. Is that is that going (laughs) going to happen? No, no, Nick. To, to, no, no. Um, um, Nick is a great guy, and he wrote a great script. Um, you say is it going to happen? The answer is yes. I'm not exactly sure when, though. Yeah. I'm not exactly sure when, but Nick, he's a great guy. He's a great actor too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, John is obviously. Oh, you yeah. know, Has been in so many. You know, John's a, a a great actor, and Aida, who's their cousin. Mm-hmm. is um, you know a great actress and nick is is great too so i'm going to say yes but i'm not sure when right. i am doing i am doing a movie called the cabin girl we're going to be shooting it in um in um march in um shreveport louisiana i'm looking oh, forward wow. to that yeah i'm looking forward to that i have not shot anything in shreveport before but uh, that's a psychological thriller and i'm really looking forward to it um <laughs> So I'll be starting that. What I'm shooting now is uh, in a series for stars um, called Raising Canaan. And this is um, episode, um, not episode, uh, season two is what we're filming. And we're finishing up, um, I'll be finished up by the end of February, yeah. Um, There's a couple of, um, I'm doing like five out of 10 of the episodes. I play a mobster. I play a cops and crooks. I said that earlier. That's yeah, 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 yeah. But I really love the, you know, I I love the cast uh, in this show, and they're really great. And the showrunners, they they know what um, they know what they want, and and um, some things can become formulaic, you know, because they know what they want, and it's everything's just kind of the same machine moving. Um, This they know what they want, and they keep making it better. So it's called Raising Canaan. And that's oh, cool. on stars. I'm really, really proud to be a part of that too. All right, awesome. You know? I'll have to check that yeah. out then. Um, well, one of the, you know, I, I can't let you go without talking about it. I, I think you know whatever, that. man. Uh, you, whatever but, you mean, me, you got me. But um, you know, you 
early on in your in your film uh, career, you co-starred in a film uh, called Angie, and uh, your you know James Gandolfini was in that. You were in the Taking of Pelham One Two Three, the remake of that with him. But obviously, your closer connection was that you were along with James and Stephen Van Sant, one of the th three final people to uh, be whittled down to play the part of Tony Soprano, which Tony James, Soprano, yeah. James ended up getting, but you could play Jackie April in the first yeah. season, uh, which is probably where I think I would have to imagine because it's su such a huge show still 20 odd years later, uh, yeah. to keep getting into it, that that's probably where most people know you from at this point. Uh, how does it feel to be part of something like that so long lasting like that? Well, all right. So listen, I'll tell you. Um, so I met Jimmy when we did Angie and we uh, we come from kind of the same part of the, the country. I'm from outside the city. Again, Italian American background. He was from. I'm right on the border of New Jersey, where I grew up in Rockland County. He's right. was from Jersey, Park Ridge. So I mean, we were we grew up, you know, 20 minutes from each other. Not that I knew him back then. No, but no, but it's you still saw that, that suburban. It's that, but that same suburban working class Italian American thing. So when we met up, we got immediately. We got very close. We both liked to go out. We had a good time. We could, you know, paint the town red and and stuff like that. He was in Angie. He was great, man. He plays, um, you know, Gina Davis's boyfriend and stuff. And he used to yeah. go, yeah, yeah. No, he was like, what you doing with me is what he would say to me on the, yeah. in between takes. Like, you know, he was very self, self-effacing kind of, you know? Yeah. Um, um, but he, I mean, he was great and we became good friends and, and very, um, we talk about, you know, things, you know, kind of deep and we both wanted to, we both came from the theater, you know, off, 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 you know, Broadway, off, off Broadway, I had a theater company, he had done shows like that. We talk about, you know, when the parents would come and, and everything, we shared a lot of the same things. And then I did um, The Juror with him mm -hmm. and uh, it was Demi Moore and um, Alec Baldwin. Yeah. And he was in that one as well. So, you know, we were we were going up for the same roles a lot. Yeah. And we got, you know, he'd get six out of ten in the beginning, you know. Yeah. Jimmy was big, bigger than me. And a lot of the roles at the time you went up for were, you know, being tough guy roles. So uh, big makes a difference in that. Doesn't matter. We both, I, I'm happy for him. You know, I would be happy. Yeah, yeah. Um, then we did. Then the Sopranos comes around, and we both went up to, for it, and um, and I always know it because it'd always be like Jimmy's going for it too, you know. Yeah. And we both went in, and we're out in Los Angeles, and we went in uh, to read for the HBO guys and David Chase. We had to go in and out a few times, and I said, "Look, I'm staying across the street because they flew me to LA." And I said, "I'm staying at the hotel across the street. When you're done, let's have lunch." And he's like, yeah, good, man. You know, so I did my stuff. Then he went and did his stuff. And then he comes over and we met and we had lunch. And I said, look, if it ain't me, it's you. If it ain't you, it's me. You know, this is great. You know, whatever. He said, yeah, man, this is great. Because that's the way we were. It's like somebody's oh, yeah. Get, you know? Yeah, yeah. So it was very, he was always very generous. You know, um, I mean, we were generous to each other about that. We'd call each other up about roles that I couldn't get to and that you should find out about this. So um, it was very nice. It was really good. And then they went back and forth for like a week. Oh, they want you. They want him. They want you. They want him. They want you. And then finally, I get the final word. They want him. This is coming from my manager. And I said, ah, fuck. Because I really wanted that part. Sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. When you're when you're in that zone where you if you're it's a 50 50 shot. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, listen, I wanted that. I mean, I couldn't play it now. I'm, like, older and everything else. But then I was like, oh, I know how to play this part. And I really wanted my shot at it. But I called up Jimmy and I said, hey, congratulations, you fuck. I'm glad you got, you know, glad you got it. And he laughed and he said, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I said, you're going to kill it. You know, yeah. you're going to, you know, you're going to be great in it and stuff like that. Because he hadn't done TV before. He had done, no. you know, film. I had done film. I had done a few series at that point. I said, you're going to, you know, you're going to love it. And, you know, it's going to be great. 
Um, and I was, you know, again, I was happy for him, but I, I you know, I just knew yeah. when I read that script how great this is. And I thought it was going to run for a long time. And I would have loved it because they shot it in New York, you know, and that's where I, I live. Yeah. And I was just starting a family at the time. So anyways, the rest is history as far as, as far as that goes. But David Chase called me up and said, you know, I want you to play this part. It's originally written for an older man like 75 years old, but I think it's better if he's a contemporary of Tony's. And I said, mm -hmm. all right, let me read it. And I read it. And I go, hey, I die. I don't want to die. You know, this show's going to run. I told David. Yeah, yeah. He said, well, we don't know how long we're going to run. You know, he came from, he had come from uh, network TV. He said, I only got right. an order for 15. And network TV, they give you an order and then they, they cancel the show after four or five of them. They, you know, right. there's no guarantee. But this was HBO. It was a new animal, and he was still had the the network TV thing in mind, I imagine. And he said, "I don't even know if we're going to get the 13 out of it. That's what the order is." Because I said, "Make me a boss. You know, I don't have to be on all the time. Make me a boss or a guy who comes up from Philly or come up from South Jersey every once in a while. I've got to be a regular." And he said, "I don't have any characters like that because you know you mark out your season. You know, right, right." He's on my phone in my apartment at the time. Um. He said, I don't have anybody like that. And um, I said, well, I, you know, I don't want to die on the show. This is a marathon. It's not a sprint, you know. But again, he didn't know how far he was going to go. So he right. wanted me to be a part of it. And I always appreciate that he called me up at home and asked me to, to you know, to be this because this is all I can offer you, you know, um, at, the, at that point. I said, Listen, what else if I do? I'll do it, but how about you make me the brother who gets out of prison next year? I'll shave my head. I'll be the brother, a twin brother, come out of prison, and I'll do all of this. Yeah, yeah. You know, and then I'll do that. And like he's looking for his own stuff, and he goes, "Hey, that's a great idea." He didn't say it's a great idea. Yes, I'll do that in your cast. But right. Well, they ended up doing it basically with David uh, Provol. David Provol. Oh yeah, he did. He did. Yeah. Who, who, in my opinion, yeah. his character was absolutely the, 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 the he, David's great in it. Uh, don't get me wrong. Yeah. But Richie April was the biggest hard on that series oh. absolutely ever had. He was a fucking lunatic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He was, no, no, he was a lunatic. And Davey Proval was great at it. I mean, he was yeah. a lunatic. And you know it was great too. Joey Pants, some years later, Ralph. Yeah, Pants. yeah. Well, he originally wasn't their first choice. They they wanted Ray Liotta. I heard. And, well, listen, in the yeah. new new Soprano thing, um, Ray's in that. Yeah, Ray's in that. And guess what? There's a two. There's a brother in prison and a brother. <laughs> right. And a brother. So listen, I'm going to tell you right now. The victors. What, what do they say? The victors. Right. The victor the gets the spoils. So, well, not, not just the spoils, but, you know, who writes the history? The ones who win, right? Right, right. right. So, you know, you'll hear this story from, you know, who knows how David tells it. It doesn't, or or whatever else. But I'll tell you, that's this is exactly, you know, what happened. Yeah. And, um, but I've always appreciated it. And he was always very supportive of other things that I did. Uh, David Chase yeah. was very nice. And then he, and then in the third season, they had a flashback thing and they brought me back on. Yeah. And what's great about that show, and I'll tell you what's so great, is like I knew Mike Imperioli, my first movie, I did it with Michael. And then okay. I did, and later on with Jimmy, I did a movie called Lonely Hearts. Okay. And we did another movie together. Well, but taking a Pelham, you did, yeah. You did the remake of Pelham 1, 2, 3. Yeah, Pelham, yeah, yeah. Um, but I'm saying, but we also, socially, we knew each other. And, and you know, I mean, we... His son, Michael, my son was born uh, first. And within the year, about a year later, Michael was born. I feel like it was a year later. Um, and uh, and he, um, so I knew Michael when he was little in New York. But then uh, the mother and everything moved out to L.A. So Jimmy wanted to be out there with him. And this is after a bunch of years. So I hadn't seen Michael since he was a baby, little. And he, he wouldn't have remembered me. So when we were doing the deuce, which I love doing the deuce, you know, yeah. uh, Jim, you know, with um, uh, David, David Simon. Simon and George Pelicanos and and everybody in the cast and James um, Franco it was a great guy. But I mean, he was he was um, a really big part of the um, uh, the creative process. 
there, but uh, you know, I'll just say it. Uh, I'll say it that way. And um, and then Maggie Haberman. Sorry, sorry. That's freaking the New York Times. Maggie Gyllenhaal, who's right, tremendous. Right. And I don't know yeah. if you saw the movie The Lost Daughter. I haven't yet. What, oh, what a directing debut! I mean, yeah. I'm like, holy smokes, tremendous. She's she is fierce and fearless, you know. Yeah. And um, anyways, it was a great it was a great cast and, and great to be part of all that. Anyways, in the second season, they brought in Michael Gandolfini, not stunt casting. He earned that part, and he right. was great. I mean, he was just, he was great. So it was nice to see him after all of these years. I think he was 18, 19. Yeah. And I'm like, you don't remember me, pal, because I used to see a lot when you were little, you know. But yeah. um, but he was um, he was great. And then I happened to do a film with him called Cherry. You know, I just oh, did this. Oh, right, uh, Russo Brothers. Yeah, yeah. And Michael was out there. But um, so Michael, myself, uh, a couple of the other actors in... The Deuce, we would go and see a Broadway show, then we go to a restaurant. James, Franco, you know, as well. Um, all, we all love going to, we'd see theater, and then we go to a restaurant and kind of BS and everything about it. So we got to know each other, everybody very well. And on a creative end of things, it's great sitting around and, and BSing, you know, you know, you argue about a moment in a true phone movie, you know. I mean, like, yeah. it's great. You love that kind of banter. But jumping back to The Sopranos, it was a great time. I'm very proud to be a part of it. I'll be honest with you, it was tough that I couldn't be more of it at the time because it just kind of took off and it had a life of its own. And it's very, very hard. I did so many, I've done so many shows and series and everything else. And it is really difficult to find a show that goes on the air and stays on the air Never mind becomes an iconic show that's in the Smithsonian. That happened with the Sopranos. And as much as I wish I had that part, Jimmy knocked it out of the ballpark. Oh, he yeah. Was, he knocked it, he knocked it out of the park. He was an astronaut and everybody where else were flying airplanes. Um, he he was great. And so they they made the right choice. They made the right choice yeah. for him. I you I would have been good, man. I would have been really freaking good. <laughs> But he, they made the right choice. So yeah, um, I get, I get that. And he, he's somebody. When I first, and I've said this probably in some other, because I interviewed um, Paul Ben Victor recently, and he was in True Romance with him, and we got to talk talking about uh, James. And I said that True Romance was the first movie I ever saw James in, and it was when I saw that film, I looked at him and I saw this guy. This is somebody to watch. And he came out with Angie, you know, you were in that. And then he was in something with John Cusack, uh, Money for Nothing or something like where he played John Cusack's he, brother. J Jimmy, Jimmy did around the same time. He didn't like a lot of the films he did as all of us actors. Like, I don't like watching myself yeah. because I'm always going, ah, I could do that better. You did that freaking thing and you made the same mistake you did in the other project. You know, yeah, yeah. you become critical of yourself. And once they yeah. say... Cut, we got it, check the gate, moving on. There's nothing you could do except pray that they got a great editor, you know, because right, right. because that's what you did, except the stage. I mean, stage, it's you up there. Once they say places, curtain, and then, you know, till the end of that show, you know, right, when the curtain right. comes down. But in film, you you for me, it's like you always hope, yeah, I watch and I, I, you know, I'm not a perfectionist, but, you know, you kind of cringe at certain things. And Jimmy was the same way. He didn't like yeah, it, yeah. you know, watching himself and him because you know you become self, um, almost too self-aware or something or other. But true, true romance. He said, "I'm really good in this." Yeah, he yeah. Said, so he was proud of his work. And you, yeah. Watch so him. yeah. He's so great. when he got when he came out in the Supremes, I'm like, you know, I I know that guy. I like that guy. He's he was in Get Shorty. He was in Crimson Tide. He was in some other stuff, but he wasn't in anything until that point which was a lead role, you know, and it's just, uh, it's always interesting. And as a final question, because you kind of made a mention of, of theater and film, is TV the balance of those two? Because you do, number one, in a film, you don't even know necessarily if you're a supporting character, if you'll even make it to the end. You know, like you might get cut out of the film entirely unless it's. A well, movie. I mean, listen, you never know if you end up on the cutting room floor, as they say, but. 
Um, it, you know, you could tell by the you could tell by the script if if your character is integral for the turning of the drama, the story. Right. You know, you're going to be in there. You don't know how many you're going to be in there, how much. You right. got a pretty good idea because they need this scene, they need that information I give or that action that I'm delivering. Um, you know, lesser lesser roles. You're not sure how much you're going to be in. Obviously, right. you know, definitely. The di I'll, I'll give you a quick difference. For, so for stage, it's you out there the whole time. And when right. you're saying, I did a play, 2015 it was, and then I did another one in 2017 or 18, I forget. Because I come from a theater I love. We had a theater company, and I, you know, it's, that's where I learned your, my craft, as they say. And uh, we did a play, Stephen Adley Girgis, who wrote Motherfucker with the Hat on Broadway. Oh, yeah, he's, yeah. He's written uh, so many uh, great plays, you know. But he wrote um, Between Riverside and Crazy. And I was lucky enough to be in it. And it's a great cast. And, um, and we worked hard on it. And we put that show up. It ended up winning the Pulitzer that year. And right now they're saying they're going to put it on Broadway. This next fall, we're going to start rehearsals for it. Oh, cool. The difference when you're doing a play, one that you like, one that's great like that, like Stephen's play, is that they say places and the lights go up and it's you in front of that live audience, which is, again, what I trained from. And so did Jimmy Gandolfini, Mike Imperioli and, and you know, guys like that. You you make a mistake. You got to make you got to keep moving forward, 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 forward until the lights come down. You know, you can't stop it in a film. You, you know, um, uh, you know, you go, ah, I screwed that up. I fucked it up. Can we take that again? You know what I mean? So you could just start over again and do that scene right, over right, again. Right. It up. But okay, there was a bobble in the middle of that scene. Let's just do a pickup because you're editing it together. So the difference is, you know, the discipline on the stage, you know, but you're rehearsing for six weeks and then you got two weeks at least of previews. So, you know, you're, you're in shape for an audience and the audience is the other scene member and it's an exchange of energy in the moment. It's magical, but then it goes away. You know, it's ephemeral in that sense, you know, TV is fast. It's really fast. They got to shoot 12 pages in a day. You got to have that stuff down. They got to move that camera, move that camera, get those lines out. Let's go. Move it, move yeah. it, move it. But when it comes to TV, um, that's really fast stuff. It's a different medium. You know, stage, you got six weeks to do it. They might call me today and say, hey, you work today's Friday. They might say you're working Monday. I am working Monday, but I know my lines are in. <laughs> they might say you're working Monday and uh, we got to put you in. So we need you right now. You know, we need you to do it. You go, shit, I didn't know I had eight pages. So you got to get that down. And now you're on there and you got to film it. And that's its own skill, you know, really fast. Film, you have, you're going to film four pages in a day, yeah. five pages in a day. So yeah. rather than the 12 that TV's telling you to film or the eight or whatever, um, now you've got that 12 hours just to film four or five pages, you know? Right. So that's a little bit slower. Um, so therefore, there's a little more concentration. There's a little bit more time to ease into it and get into it. A lot of times with TV, there's a certain amount of brown and serve because they got to get going. They yeah. got to get, get today because we got to get tomorrow too, you know? Yeah. Am I answering any of that right? No, no, that makes I, – that's a, that's, a, that's a good answer. I think that makes perfect sense. And I, I – yeah, I, so yeah, I no, I was just gonna wrap up because I, I, I yeah, I, good. Let's wrap up, brother. We've got we've gone over what I expected you to to do, so I because I'm yapping away. I'm just no, no, well, you. yeah. I no, you you were great. Yeah, this was a great this was a great talk. Um, good, but I, I want to thank you, uh, Michael Rispoli, who's soon to be on the offer on Paramount Plus. It's gonna be you know the subscription thing. You gotta. You gotta sign up for it. It's it's gonna be good. I think I, I have a really good feeling about it. It's gonna be great. It's yeah. gonna be great. Really, if you guys tune in and watch it. It's gonna be great. Yeah, uh, and he's also working on season two of Raising Canaan for Stars. So be on the lookout for that, Michael. I wish you the best of luck with everything. Thank, Thank you for taking the time today. Uh, hopefully, we'll get a chance to talk in the future. Sounds great, Brett. This was great. I wish you all the best. And uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the next time. All right. You have a great rest of your day.
You too. Take care now. Take care. Bye.